Now, he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. And just then, there appeared a woman with a spirit that had crippled her for 18 years. She was bent over and was quite unable to stand up straight. When Jesus saw her, he called her over and said, Woman, you are set free from your ailment. When he had laid his hands on her immediately, she stood up straight and began praising God. But the leader of the synagogue, indignant because Jesus had cured on the Sabbath, kept saying to the crowd, There are six days on which, in which work ought to be done. Come on those days and be cured, and not on the Sabbath day. But the Lord answered him and said, You hypocrites! Does not each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or his donkey from, from the manger and lead it away to give it water? And ought not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan has bound for 18 long years, be set free from the bondage on the Sabbath day? When he said this, all his opponents were put to shame, and the entire crowd was rejoicing at the wonderful things that he, that he was doing. See, it's God's good word for us, God's beloved people. Thanks be to God. Amen. So, July 20th, 1944, there was a plot against Hitler called, that ends up being called Operation Valkyrie. Some of the generals and military intelligence realized that this was a real problem, what was happening in their country, and decided the only way to stop this war that was devastating both their people and the peoples of this world was to put an end to Hitler. And so they built a bomb into a, uh, into a, a briefcase. They got the briefcase smuggled in to the room uh, where Hitler was going to be, um, and and up until this moment, the plot was 100% successful. They had successfully figured out where Hitler was going to be. They had successfully built the bomb. They successfully got the bomb into the room. And the bomb successfully went off. Unfortunately, because of the weird physics of that room and the thickness of the table, um, the plot did not kill Hitler. And so... 7,000 people got arrested by the Gestapo because of this plot, and close to 4,000 of them got put to death. Now, most of them were military officers, known dissidents, the normal who's who of who you would expect to attempt an overthrow of a government. But there was one guy on the list um, that has always stood out to me as an odd one. It was the theologian Dietrich Bonhoeffer. The theologian Dietrich Bonhoeffer, famous for his works such as The Cost of Discipleship and Life Together, which you will hear about from me a lot. Anyone who has listened to me talk for any length of time will hear about Bonhoeffer. At least, I don't know, we're going to track it, but at least once a month he's going to come up in, some, in something because I think he, he is deeply important to my own theology. But during World War II, he is a German theologian leading kind of a rebel church called the Confessing Church that was trying to, you know, lead a real church rather than the Nazified church. He got pulled in to working for German military intelligence so that he could be a part of the efforts to resist Hitler. He smuggled Jewish families out of Germany into Switzerland. He traveled the world trying to contact allies and let them know that there were people who were not in favor of Hitler working in Germany, and he played a small role in organizing the July, 20, 19, July 20th, 1944 attempt on Hitler's life. He's a Christian theologian. Seems like a real strange job to become a military intelligence agent um, and work to kill a person. As I understand the Ten Commandments, um, and maybe I missed something, but it says you're not supposed to give false testimony, right? That's like in there, right? You don't lie. We, we understand that one of the things we believe is that good Christian people don't tell lies and good Christian people don't murder people, right? This seems real basic Sunday school stuff. We put the Ten Commandments out in front of courthouses, right? Like, you don't lie, and you don't commit murders. And yet, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, the Christian theologian, lied a lot 
when he was a military intelligence agent because he wasn't really working for military intelligence. His whole job was a lie. He was doing it so that he could organize for the other, other side to overthrow Hitler. And not only did he tacitly endorse the killing of Hitler, he actively worked towards the killing of Hitler. While he was imprisoned by the Nazis, he wrote a book about his experience. He called it Ethics. It is, unfortunately, unfinished. Actually, the bit that's unfinished is he was going to write this chapter about his hope for the future. He didn't get to write his chapter on hope for the future because he got put to death in 1944 in a concentration camp. That's why he didn't get to finish his book. I always find it the deep irony of ethics. The last unfinished chapter of ethics is the, about the future that Bonhoeffer himself did not get to see. But what he says in ethics, and it's 900 pages, and so I do not invite you to read it. You want to read Bonhoeffer, read Cost of Discipleship, um, Life Together, and then move on with your life because you've learned what you need to learn. But ethics, which is about this thing, talks about that Hitler was just awful. That it was the worst thing that could happen to humanity at that moment, and that thus, in order to uphold some idea of loving neighbor, there was, in his mind, no other choice but to take even more drastic action. He never uses the word Hitler in ethics, but against this kind of absolute concentration of evil. But even then, he does not know, right? He wonders if his actions place guilt on his soul. And so he realizes that is part of our need for grace. That where our ability, where our, when we have an inability to square the letter of the law and the movement of God in the world, it is part of why we need God's grace. We see part of this dynamic happening here in Luke chapter 13. In Luke 13, the synagogue leader is 100% correct about the letter of the law. He's got it nailed, and he is focusing on something that in Judaism at the time and for a thousand years previous had mattered a lot. The Sabbath is, as I say in the, in the Grow, Pray, Study, it's not some obscure piece of religious doctrine, right? This is not debating whether you use the King James version of the Bible or the, or the NIV version of the Bible, right? This is like a headline, like, what makes us Jewish? We observe the Sabbath. It's in the Ten Commandments. Many of the heroes of the Old Testament are heroes because they uphold the Sabbath law. God in God's self, on, in creation, observes the Sabbath. It was one of, one of, and remains, one of the most important pieces of religious practice for Jews then and now. And so if you just look at the letter of the law, the letter of the law says, you don't do anything on the Sabbath. You don't work. All you do is worship God. You don't cook. You do your cooking the night before the day before, and so that on the Sabbath, when that sun goes down on Friday until the sun sets on Saturday, all you do is you light your candle, you rest, and you go to the synagogue to worship. Sydney and I used to live right next door to an Orthodox Jewish neighborhood in Atlanta, right? And it was amazing, right? There were Jewish-owned businesses in the shopping center right across the street from our apartment. They were all closed from sundown on Friday to sundown on Saturday, like clockwork. There was a great Jewish diner, deli type thing. It was great food, but you just had to know it's written off from sundown Friday to sundown Saturday. Ain't gonna happen, and that was the year of our Lord, 2011, not 2,000 years ago. It was even more important then. And so you hear in his words, in the words of the synagogue leader, he's not wrong. He is quoting from the law, and his interpretation of the law, if you just think of the law as a checklist of rules, is 100% correct. Here again, um, verse 14, yeah, 14, there we go, I can read. But the leader of the synagogue, indignant because Jesus had cured on the Sabbath, kept saying to the crowd, there are six days on which we ought 
work ought to be done, come on those days and be cured and not on the Sabbath. Yep, absolutely. 100% correct. That is what the law says. That is the letter of the law that says nothing happens on the Sabbath. But Jesus' response to that is very telling. Because it begins to push against the bounds of just thinking of following God as following a checklist of rules. And instead, it is about following the purpose and movement of God and and the rules and the laws helping shape that. And as he says in verses 15 and 16, But the Lord answered him and said, You hypocrites, does not each of you on the Sabbath, untie his ox or his donkey from the manger and lead it away to give it water. And ought not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan bound for 18 long years, be set free from the bondage on the Sabbath day? You have this law. Do not do anything on the Sabbath. But they live in the desert, right? Um, and in the desert, if you abandon your farm animals for too long, um, they could die of dehydration fairly quickly. So even in the early Sabbath regulations, they added a little bit of a fudge factor because in the end, we didn't want all of the farm animals dying on the Sabbath day. And so look, yeah, 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 you're not supposed to work, but don't let all of your farm animals die. And so if they need to be untied, led to the water, and led back, by all means, do not let this, no, do not let Sabbath day be annual, you know, weekly animal cruelty day. Let your farm animals make it. And his point is, if I can care for my farm animals on the Sabbath, Can we not then care for this beloved, wonderful child of God who's been suffering for 18 years? That maybe there is something slightly more to this law about the Sabbath than about torturing animals and torturing people. Yes, we are meant to give an entire day over to the worship and praise of God. That's true for us now as it was then. We switched the day, but like we're all supposed to be resting in God on the Sabbath day. But if that resting on the Sabbath day is leading us to commit acts of cruelty, whether that be to humans or animals, clearly we need to expand what it means to follow God's law. That if Jesus is the summation of the law, if he is summation of the law and declares us to love God and love neighbor, that this is the true purpose behind the law. That when the law, letter of the law begins to drastically conflict with our call to both love God and love neighbor, we need to start to expand ourselves what it means to follow God's law at all. In Dietrich Bonhoeffer's mind, if, the, if, if saying thou shalt not kill means that one of history's great evils gets to continue to do the evil, wrought the evil upon the earth, killing millions, then maybe he needs to expand, knowing he might get it wrong, he needs to expand what it means to follow God's law, because sometimes loving your neighbor as yourself means putting to an end the dire evil that killed 12 million in the Holocaust, right? So this boils down, in my mind, to three non-simple steps. You know, they, they always say you're supposed to end a sermon with three points, and the internet will tell you, I'm supposed to tell you at three, a simple list, and this is going to be easy. Here's the news. It is three very simple statements to make. Um, in this lie, the heart of discipleship, and it is a tremendous challenge. So here are my three unsimple steps uh, to understanding moral decision-making, ethical decision-making as a Christian disciple. Step one, 90% of the time, do what the law says. of the time, follow the rules. 
Turns out the rules exist not just to be rules, but to give us a way to take this abstract understanding of love God and love neighbor and turn it into something that we can actually do, right? How do I love God and love neighbor? Well, I love God by taking a day off every week and giving that totally over to God. And I love my neighbor by not lying to them, by not killing them, by sharing with them, by welcoming them when they're a stranger in a strange land. All these things that are in the law, right? These are give us tools. Give us concrete actions. It's good teaching, right? If, when, I, when I was a teacher, I, I taught students with intellectual disabilities who just don't have a lot of abstract thinking ability. It's not their strong suit. God love them. They're wonderful. I loved teaching them. But like, you had to get real concrete. And so I couldn't put a, a, a rule that said, respect your neighbor. They have no idea what that would mean. And so I had to put a rule that said, keep your hands to yourself. That is, uh, the law is that, right? If we were to love God and love neighbor, okay. Well, how do we turn that into a set of classroom instructions? We turn that into a set of classroom instructions by saying, uh, love God by taking a day off and going to religious services, by making your annual sacrifices, by doing those things. And you love your neighbor by not killing them, by not lying to them, by not coveting their wife, spouse, farm animal, etc. Welcoming them when they are in a strange land, on and on and on. And for 90% of cases, that's a really great idea. The law exists for a reason. The Old Testament and the New Testament have all sorts of suggestions and rules and ways that we can follow God. Fantastic. Step two, 10% of the time, throw that entirely out the window. Because in that, those edge cases, 10% or less, but those edge cases, following the law is the worst thing that you can do. Your spouse has just bought a new set of clothing. They emerge from the bathroom and ask, and, and, you, and ask you, honey, does this make me look fat? I really should stop asking my wife this. I'm really putting her in a terrible position. Every time I buy new clothes, does this look flattering on me? And she's going to say the same thing no matter what we do. She's going to say, yes, honey, it looks great. I have no idea if she's telling the truth, but she definitely gave the right answer. And whether she was following the letter of the law or not, I'll never know because I'm never going to ask her that part because she would then also uh, tell me. But those edge cases... We have to dig far deeper than the law told me so. Therefore, I do this. Because you might leave a woman who has this one opportunity to be healed. You might leave her unhealed. And what a horrendous tragedy that would be. That you might let an evil continue to propagate in the world because you did not do what you needed to end it. It requires deep study, not just about the letter of the law, but read the Bible in a way that it teaches you who God is. Pray in your own heart and grow closer to God so you know the sound of God's voice in your ear saying, this is what I need you to do. It was really easy for Jesus. Jesus is the word of God. Jesus is never going to get that wrong. Jesus doesn't have to work to grow close to God. He is God. And for us, it's a little harder. So it's part of the work of discipleship, why we need to grow closer to God. It's not just so we can know the laws and check them off. But when we run up against those things where the law isn't enough, that we know who God is. We know who God is in our life. We know who God wants us to be. We know what God's voice sounds like. And so we can make a good faith effort at doing what God actually wants us to do, needs us to do in that moment. And that's a life of work. And it's only step two. That is our life's work as disciples and part of why we are called upon to grow closer to God. It's easy to follow a checklist and 90% of the time, that works great. That last 10% though, that's where the study comes in. The growing closer to God comes in. And the last thing, step three, is accept that we're going to always be people in need of grace. Sometimes we're going to run up against one of those edge cases. We're going to take an action, and we're going to get it wrong. 
We're not going to do the thing that God wanted us to do. We're going to break the law for our own reasons or for the wrong reasons and not for God's reasons, and we're going to need to be forgiven for that. Good friend of Dietrich Bonhoeffer and another theologian that I respect, a guy named Reinhold Niebuhr. Um, he actually shows up in our Grow, Pray study. He wrote the Serenity Prayer. Um, and Reinhold Niebuhr, as a theologian, says what the Serenity Prayer says, which is that, look, we are imperfect people. We're going to get it wrong sometimes. That doesn't stop us from having to act. Sometimes we have to act in this world as Christian people to heal to provide love and compassion, to resist evil and oppression. We may also get that wrong. We may do the wrong thing even though we tried. And so we are a people in need of God's grace. And hear the good news for us. Hear the good news, friends. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love towards us. Always, in the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Step one, 90% of the time, the law is a real useful tool to understand how God wants you to live and be. Step two, 10% of the time, you're going to have to really know God. You have to dig deep into who God is and who God wants you to be, because that's going to be, you may have to take an action that does not look like the law at all. And step three is to understand that you're not always going to get it right even in a faithful journey of discipleship. And we're going to need that grace of God. Wonderfully, graciously, thankfully, we have in our lives. I would sell a lot of books if I would declare that a simple process and make it seem easy. But it ain't. It is the work of a lifetime to grow that close to God. But it is part of why we are called upon to do that. So that we can truly know God. Know God's will and God's ways. So we can truly serve God and be God's people in the world.